Hey guys, uh, I have a very special guest here, one and only Adam, and he has a very interesting YouTube channel in which he's not only talking about entrepreneurship, but also about health and fitness and kinesthetics and uh, how to eat healthy. And there is like so many things that I can't even like, I can't really even describe what you're talking about because like I saw your channel intro and then there's like, we're talking about this and that and that and everything just sounds yeah. so smart. Uh, that I'm like, wow, I need to get this guy here on my channel and I need to sort of, you know, get all the best knowledge and share with my audience. So I really appreciate you being here, Adam. Thank you so Thank you much. Um, would you would you mind sharing a brief story about you just so that um guys who don't know you yet could just you know find out a little bit more about who you are and what you do and how are you where you are right now certainly yeah so um my youtube channel that you uh, very kindly mentioned there is the bioneer and the focus is kind of like you say a bit all over the place i i cover um working online uh, self-improvement uh, bodybuilding um fitness nootropics, transhumanism, all that kind of stuff. So um, I've got into this in various different ways. Like you, um, I'm a freelancer. So when I left university, I studied psychology at university, which is partly where my interest in the brain and neuroscience and nootropics comes from. Uh, when I left university, like, a, like more and more people these days, I didn't particularly fancy going into the world of work. I had done um, a one-year placement on my course as a writer at Writer's News. So that helped me get into writing. Um, and I had a friend who was a, um, an entrepreneur also. He owned a website that was actually held the number one position for the keyword make money online. So as you can imagine, that was a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did very well. And he was a really nice guy. And he showed me the ropes and showed me how to um, make a bit of money online. Uh, but I, I wasn't so much into the uh, marketing side of things, I much prefer, I, I would say I'm probably a creative at heart. So I was more into creating stuff. So I started out as a freelance writer. I realized that, you know, if people are making money from websites on Google, this is quite early on. I guess I left university about uh, nine years ago. So this is yeah, quite a while back. Uh, I realized that if people are making money from websites, then they need content. So I started selling my writing online. Um, and I wrote about uh, psychology because I had that experience I wrote about making money online because I had a bit of experience with that and I work, wrote about fitness because that was my uh, big you know personal hobby that I was really interested in and so although at first I, I took on pretty much any job that came along as an SEO writer writing I mean you might have had some experience with this I don't know sometimes I would write about car windshields sometimes I'd write about uh, bricklaying you know just anything that the clients needed but over time I tried to focus more and more on my areas of interest, which were fitness and technology. So I had that going and that did quite well for me for a while. And then at the same time, I also learned programming because, um, well, you know, I could see that that was also a skill that was in demand. So I created an app called Multiscreen Multitasking. Uh, that did quite well. So that brought in another uh, revenue stream. And then I got the chance to work with a big YouTuber called Cold Fusion, um, Dagogo Outrade. I helped him make his Voxis launcher. He's now got I think over, certainly over 2 million subscribers, if not 3 million. And fortunately, those experiences then also uh, led to me working with Android Authority. Um, and I now also review phones for them and I do development uh, articles and content. So that's given me lots of exposure and all this experience. And you know, over the last eight years, I've been writing about health and fitness, which is also, like I say, my area of interest and with a bit of um, psychology background. I you know, tied this together and I decided to make my own brand, that being the Bioneer. Um, and that's been thanks to the help of Android Authority in particular, because they taught me how to, you know, be better with my camera. They get, got me the right equipment and I learned some of the uh, techniques they were using to promote their channel and applied it to mine. And so I've been able to grow my following now to 39,000 subscribers. I'm aiming for 50,000 by the end of the year. Um, and, and I've also written a book um, on programming and I'm currently in the work in the process of writing another book uh, for a publisher called App Press which is on the same topics that you cover 
um, working online. It's called The Gig Economy or something like that. I think the title's a work in progress. So, so yeah, that's how I got into everything. That's a very brief version, so I've talked for a while already. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm you know, writing technology and I do these things to allow myself to spend more time and focus more on the things that are my you know, real passions, which are um, fitness, technology, and neuroscience, all with a kind of like geek culture, um, science fiction event. And then I bring it all to my channel and I'm hoping to carry on growing that. And yeah, working on all these projects. But as we discussed a little bit earlier, there's uh, only so much time in the day and that's one of the continuing challenges. Mm -hmm. How do you, what's your current take on uh, gig economy? What's the current state of gig economy in your eyes? The reason why I'm asking you this is because I talk so much on my channel about this. I talk about gig economy. I talk about whether this is um, a good thing to do to pay someone, you know, less money in another country, do arbitrage, all these controversial topics. And uh, in general, I'm a big fan of paying for task for process not for time uh i talk a lot about this i was wondering what is your take on this well yeah gig, gig economy it's such a broad term uh, when the publishers contact me about it i had to spend a while like defining what it meant because gig economy can mean stuff like uber of course or like Deliveroo. you know it doesn't necessarily whereas to you and me it probably means more online gigs and um, it also means that look at those sorts of examples of the gig economy they, they actually, I don't think they really benefit the people doing the work. And that's because it tends to be, you know, uh, I, yeah, the, the setup seems to benefit the company more. They've got all the advantages of having an employee because they're pretty much wed to just that one company and they know they're going to be there when they need them. They've got all, as, as a worker, you've got all the disadvantages of being um, self-employed because you're, you know, there's, there's not that same consistency um, so you've got all the, all the negatives and none of the positives if you do it that way. But, you know, it appeals to some people, I'm sure. And some, someone will probably say, this is a great way to earn money. But for me, I think it makes a lot more sense uh, to work on a, on a per job basis online where they're coming to you instead of um, you sticking with one client. Um, you know, you talk a lot about Upwork and Fiverr. And I think that's got a lot more potential. Like you say, there's still a lot of uh, kinks to be ironed out, like the arbitrage aspect, like you say. But I, as a writer, I'm competing a lot with um, people in India who can charge a lot less than me in order to, uh, you know, often it's pidgin English, but not always. And so, you know, sometimes I have to lower my per word rate right on down. But I think you have to be smart about how you go about it. Like, for instance, you've got to build your reputation, um, you know, work with big brands um, where possible so you can put that in a portfolio, um, learn to work faster and smarter. You know, um, Tim Ferriss talks about things like prep and pickup or mm -hmm. sometimes you, on Fiverr in particular, you can create like, instead of saying I'm a programmer or I'm an app developer, something I've been thinking of doing is saying, I'll turn your website into an app and then just have a template and then just put that in there. So then you can bring down your prices and you can compete with those, um, you know, uh, people who have the lower cost of living. And likewise, if they build up the experience and things. So I think basically there's a lot of potential there. And I think, I hope in the future, more and more people are going to do it because as someone who works freelance, I've enjoyed tons of benefits from it. Like you, I, I'm not a, a full-time digital nomad like you, but I've been able to travel a lot more than I other, otherwise would be. I've been able to work on things that I'm passionate about, spend more time in the gym than I would be otherwise. So I hope it works out. And I think that I think it's unstoppable. I think it will take over. Like why would a company hire someone from their local talent pool, pay them a fixed wage, do all the documents when they could just hire some superstar online, you know, for a one-off job. So I think it will happen. It's inevitable. And yeah, you could, you can end up being at the bottom of that or you can end up being at the top of that. You just got to be smart about the way you package yourself, you promote yourself. I see it more, see yourself as a brand and then create that brand and then you can put, charge the money. So yeah, I think it's got a lot of potential and I think in the future then automation will change everything again, you know, but that's another discussion. Do you think everyone should go ahead and start developing brand just like you are and just like I am a brand online where, when, where we were just putting ourselves out there? Yeah, I, yeah, I think, I mean, it's only recently that I've, because for ages I wanted to, you know, build a website or create an app that would make me, you know, money, you know, passive income potentially 
or just allow me to focus on things. And I was, I was doing the writing as a kind of like side project almost, uh, bootstrapping myself with the writing basically, so I could afford to invest the time and the money in the things that I thought would eventually take off. But then I've realized that actually it all ties together. It's all part of my package that I bring to the table. And doing those other things has allowed me to charge more for the writing. Like that, if I hadn't done the work on the apps, then I wouldn't have got the work with Android Authority. And if I hadn't done the work with Android Authority, then I might not have got the opportunity to write a book. And now having the Bioneer, now that it's got a few more um, subscribers and it's starting to gain traction, that's starting to bring in new opportunities as well. So yeah, I actually think my sister for recently worked in recruitment and what, you know, not nothing like us, you know, not online specifically or anything like that, just regular recruitment, but even on there, like they're using LinkedIn more. And I mean, LinkedIn is not that different from Upwork really. So I think even if you're not into this kind of work that, like we are, you're right that building a brand for yourself and kind of looking at it as R and D for yourself, I think is a really good way of then, you know, especially as the um, economy changes, I think it'll be really useful to approach it in that way. So yeah, build followers. Anyone can have a blog, can't they? It doesn't have to be massive, but if you just showcase what you're good at, I think it can lead to lots of opportunities. Do you think it should be as niche specific as possible or do you think it's okay to um, make it broad? Like for example, your channel is quite broad. Like it's pretty hard to say, hey, Adam is an expert in this or this because he's an expert in like six different things, which is good and could be a risk as well because you're not sort of like, you know, targeting to become, you know, the best person in this one thing. I don't know if you heard this book, but at the same time, um, we are, you know, we have different skills and it's possible obviously that you have few. Uh, have you ever considered that? Like sort of how niche specific do you have to be with your brand development? Yeah, 100%. I think you're right. It has been a challenge for me to, um, have such a broad niche because I, what do I advertise myself as? Where do I advertise myself? You know, in terms of keywords, it's much more difficult because, you know, I don't even like to call it self-improvement necessarily because sometimes I think that has certain con connotations. Same with biohacking, one word that describes what I do. And that is definitely a disadvantage. Like you say, it can also be an advantage because to be honest, like obviously I'm all about, um, being the best uh, that you can. And, you know, I like to be optimistic, but I do acknowledge that I'm probably never going to be the very best at bodybuilding or the very best at parkour or the very best at psychology, but maybe I can be, I can offer something unique that stands out by combining them in a unique way. And it does make it a bit harder to market yourself. But I think what that then means is I have, to, I've tried to focus more on the value proposition and that kind of, uh, less the more abstract aspect of my brand so instead of saying pioneer um fitness and technology it's kind of like i'm focusing more i wanted it to be so that when someone saw my logo and the name even if they didn't know exactly what i was about they'd know if it was for them or not and i hopefully i'm i've achieved that i mean i'd like to have a bigger budget to spend on my production values and things and hopefully that will come in time you know with like I've got a kind of synth wave soundtrack that I use all the time, which kind of ties it in with the kind of transhuman and the, and the um, comic aspect of it. And I've got, you know, sort of hexagons everywhere, which I think sort of, I don't know, I hope that it kind of sells what it is, even though it's not something that's easy to describe in a couple of words. And I've got a tagline, which is um, action performance technology or something like that. And I think that hopefully all of it, I hope helps to communicate what it is. And I actually really like the idea of creating a new niche by combining other niches. And I know people have done it a lot better than me. And the one I always look at is, I don't know him personally. I just admire his work. Uh, you know, the, I don't know what his name is. The guy who does the art of manliness. I think that's such a good example of a niche that wasn't a niche before, but he, he manages to cover such a broad spectrum of things while still having a very clear um, value proposition. The same goes for nerd fitness, if you've heard of that one. It's again, it's just combines two things to create something new. And, and in some ways it creates new marketing opportunities because I can create a video on martial arts or I can create a video on um, productivity or brain training. And then hopefully there'll be some people in that brain training community that also have a bit of an interest in martial arts. And then that'll bring them over. I can combine topics and say, 
brain training for martial arts, for instance, or, you know, how to stay fit if you're someone who works online, that, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it has, has pros and cons. And in terms of building your own personal brand from a career progression perspective, I think it does help a lot to be niche when it comes like on Fiverr or Upwork. I, I tend to say it's better to say that you're a unity developer for Android rather than to say you're a developer, because then you're going to get work that you like doing that you know how to do and it is easy to stand out, but then there's nothing to stop you from having that on, on, um, Upwork and lifting, listing yourself of something different on people per hour say, and then that way, all that other experience is still going to back you up, but you can still be focused when you're targeting specific markets. So, yeah. I was very interested in the fact that you can have a life full of health and at the same time run a business and have a lot of time and learn martial arts and also become smart and intelligent person because I think it covers sort of all of the areas that all of us want to have covered. Like all of us want to be healthy, wealthy, intelligent and probably improve relationships so that's that's very interesting maybe relationships is not something you're touching on your channel too much at least i haven't seen but it's very interesting because you're basically aiming where where all of us want to go um on that note could you share a little bit more on trans uh, humanism as well because that's probably something that most of my audience haven't heard of or heard of somewhere but that's a very interesting topic and me myself i had a lot of you know philosophical thoughts uh at you know in the evening when you work a lot online you just connect yourself with your computer you work so much and you start thinking like hey my mind is actually in sight <laughs> so yeah. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that a lot of us has this thoughts sometimes but uh we don't much talk about this can you introduce this idea a little bit to my audience yeah, sure. Well, um, to respond to that first bit, you can think of your computer almost like an exocortex. So in some ways, it's an extension of your own uh, thinking process. And in the future, that might be an implant or a chip. Whether or not that's a good thing is a whole other matter. But that's the idea behind transhumanism is it's, it basically means using technology to take yourself beyond what you currently are. It's not about making you better. It's about, about making you better than well. Although a lot of these technologies uh, start as uh, medical uh, technologies or research, but then they get, it's basically applying those kinds of ideas to someone who's perfectly fit and healthy because they want to be faster, stronger, smarter, sleep less, that kind of thing. And yeah, there's definitely a whole lot of um, ethics and philosophy surrounding this topic. And it's actually what I did my dissertation on at university. Uh, so I had uh, students come in and they'd share their opinions on technologies that either existed already or in the works. I mean, um, there's all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, uh, gene doping to make you 30% stronger with no apparent side effects, although there might be some side effects relating to tendons. Um, of course, there's nootropics, those being uh, smart drugs, uh, supplements and things that can make you potentially smarter, although that's obviously quite a broad term. It really means boosting your memory, perhaps, or boosting your focus. And so the objection, of course, is that it could be seen as cheating. It could be seen as uh, degrading what we see ourselves as, as human. It could be, uh, you know, obviously there's potential health issues with a lot of this stuff you're experimenting with. Then on the flip side, it's cool. <laughs> and you can see that a lot of the uh, stuff that we already use is essentially going down that path. I mean, caffeine being the most obvious example of something that most of us take every single day in order to feel better. And then the next step on from that might be something like um, daphnil, which is a very popular uh, nootropic. It was originally designed to prevent narcolepsy. And this makes you stay awake longer, it improves vigilance and focus and things. But it's also, in my experience, that does have some side effects. What I'm more interested in when it comes to nootropics are things that are healthy, natural, biohacks, as in these are things that might, might be missing from our modern diets that can help us to think better that means things like maybe L-theanine or something like omega-3, which you already get in um, uh, tea and in plants. So that's nootropics. And that's one example. And then, yeah, in the future, we like to see appearing on the black market things like uh, injections to make us stronger permanently or, you know, brain implants and things. And that is something we're going to have to deal with. And I don't think it's fair to say transhumanism, this was the conclusion of my study, 
Uh, I don't think it's fair to say transhumanism is a good thing or a bad thing because it's such a broad term. Once again, you've got to focus on the specific technology in each case, in each context. And of course, um, as someone who's, you know, like you say, I'm, I'm interested in improving myself in all these different ways. But if I'm honest, it's not just, it, it comes from a nerdy place just because I, I read comics, you know, about Iron Man who runs his business and builds cool suits and flies around. And I think, why is life so mundane and boring? I don't just want to be, you know, good at stuff. I, I just want to kind of experiment with the, with the limits of what we can achieve just because it fascinates me. Um, and so, of course, transhumanism appeals to me on that aspect. So it's something I cover and talk about quite a lot. And from a business perspective, one thing that's very interesting is when you're self-employed and working, providing a service, if you can work faster and you can work better, then you can earn more. So I actually use a lot of biohacks, which eventually one day might evolve into transhuman technologies. And I use this to type more, um, to work faster and to wake up more refreshed than I otherwise would do so that I can do better work. And so again, it all kind of ties in because I think that looking after my body and my mind helps me to improve my business and vice versa, as long as that don't, you know, doesn't get too busy. What biohacks uh, do you personally use every day? Um, well, as we were saying, you, you mentioned meditation. That's something that I'm practicing with, but I, don't, I haven't stuck with it as long as I should do. But one really interesting one that I don't use every day, but I've been using um, on a more weekly basis is something called image streaming. And this means that you, uh, it's kind of like meditation, but it's more based on visualization because our brains actually work particularly well as kind of simulation devices. And when you picture something that's uh, going to happen or that you want to remember, you can, you can use your brain in a whole host of different ways. And interestingly, um, this is something that apparently Albert Einstein would do. And when you hear his description of how he came up with many of his ideas, he actually kind of, um, they came from almost intuition uh, based on him visualizing things and then um, making assumptions based on what he visualized. He said that he came up with the theory of um, relativity uh, by imagining that he was on a beam of light looking backwards and seeing what the world would look like and his brain just kind of filled in the gaps. I mean, I'm not saying we'll get to that stage, but using a brain for visualization definitely has a lot of uh, cool benefits, I think. So this is a kind of form of meditation where you're visualizing and you've got to just let things come to your mind and you just uh, speak them uh, as you see them, which is quite interesting. Uh, obviously, I also work out regularly and I'm experimenting with lots of different types of training to improve my energy levels and things like that. I actually think that, you know, if so many people want energy and I'm, I'm the same and that's a lot of people say they don't have enough time in the day to do all the things they want to do, but I think that's almost always untrue. I think most of us have the time. We just lack the energy. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't watch box sets. You wouldn't, um, you know, read through uh, books. It's, the problem is we come home and we crash out. So ways to boost energy is something I'm very interested in. So I use a whole bunch of different nootropics uh, for that. I'm using inositol at the moment, which increases your um, receptor density for dopamine and serotonin. And that's, I, I don't like nootropics that boost a uh, neurotransmitter because I think that has potential downsides, but this just makes you more receptive to them and it's natural. So I feel a lot more comfortable using that. Uh, you have omega-3, which is really neuroprotective and can also increase DHEA, which helps you stay calm when you're um, in a kind of, kind of more stressed state. Uh, breathing is something I've been focusing on a fair amount. Uh, at the moment, I'm experimenting with intermittent fasting. So Hence the water, that would normally be a cup of tea, but I don't like tea without milk in. So at the moment, I'm not, uh, I'm not eating until 2 p.m. I'm doing the 18-6, not 16-8, which is more common. So yeah, there's, there's lots of different ones. I tend to um, stick with the ones that are working for me and, and get rid of the ones that don't. It's a constant sort of uh, iteration and learning process. Some things I think are working and then they turn out to be more placebo. Other things... I've stuck with for a long time, like the image streaming, which I think is, is really cool. And um, some of your most popular videos are about um, workouts, Bruce Lee workouts, I think was 2 million views, your most popular video um, yeah. on Bruce Lee workouts. Um, I guess a lot of people are interested in this. Um, can, you, can you explain in a nutshell? Um, what kind of workout? Obviously, guys can just go to your YouTube channel and check this video if, if they want to. 
I can link it, but um, could you explain in a nutshell what kind of workouts uh, are these and why are people so interested in this that it gets two million views? Um, well, Bruce Lee, for starters, is obviously an icon and he was someone who was interested in improving himself in, in every way. And he was also a businessman and also a philosopher. So I think that's, you know, you put Bruce Lee on something, it's always going to be popular. The video really took off. I'm very pleased with how that did. And I've done a couple more since, which have done okay, but that, that one... <laughs> that one did really well. Uh, and yeah, I think the thing about Bruce Lee is that he was, uh, I, I've said he's kind of like a Da Vinci of the body. I think he was like a biohacker before his time. He was trying lots of different things. He didn't just do martial arts. He came up with his own martial art, um, that being uh, Jeet Kune Do. And he didn't just work out. He was always experimenting with new things, like he was using overcoming isometrics. This is where you just push or pull against an immovable force. And that makes you recruit more muscle fibers and it increases your mind to muscle connection um, across the neuromuscular junction. So in, in other words, you're not making your muscles bigger, but you're increasing your ability to use those muscles because he was very lean, but he was very powerful for his weight. Um, so that's the kind of thing that's really interesting about his training. And it's also, that's the kind of thing that I like to cover when I'm looking at my stuff too, because yeah, you know, going to the gym can be a bit boring, just curling weights and then going home. So I'm more interested in Again, you know, ways that you can boost your uh, performance in more interesting uh, facets. So whether that's increasing grip strength or whether it's um, doing planche and uh, hand balancing, which I'm working on currently, or, you know, improving your VO2 max, that kind of thing. So I think that's, I hope that's what people respond to on my channel. Um, it's just maybe looking at, you know, old time strongman training, kind of the underground ideas or the ideas from uh, the military, stuff that maybe other people hadn't considered. And then they can look at potentially incorporating that into their workouts or just watching it because it's interesting. You know, I think there's, there's people out there who are more ripped than I am or more strong, more experienced, but I like to deep dive deep. And as a writer who's been writing about health and fitness, that's really my, um, that's my ballpark. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, and uh, you mentioned um, Tim Ferriss before. Are you, are you a big fan of this? Um philosophy or is this one of the things that inspired you or or you just mentioned this just like that yeah tim ferris is definitely um an inspiration and yeah i'm a, I'm a big fan i haven't read his I'm, i've half read tools of titans i haven't read the newest one yet but i've read the other three the, the four hour trilogy and i was already working online um when i read his stuff so it wasn't like that got me into um doing that kind of thing but it did make me more, for one, it made me more aware of how important it is to, you know, value your free time and, you know, think about what it is that you're actually trying to achieve because success for the sake of success doesn't actually result in happiness. I like his approach of trying to minimize the, the fuss and the communication overhead so you could just focus on, you know, making money and doing things that he enjoyed. So that, that was definitely inspiration. And also you said earlier about me having lots of, the topics and lots of different niches. And that's something that was definitely inspiration from Tim Ferriss. Because I was looking at, I had an old website called The Biomatrix, which I started when I was 16. So it wasn't good. And I just needed to do a refresh, a reboot and start again. So I made The Bioneer. And I was thinking like, do I, should I just focus on fitness? Should I just focus on working online? Or A, I knew I'd get bored. And B, I looked at Tim Ferriss and I thought, well, he does, you know, fitness. Um, he does working online and he does cooking so if he can do that then i can do this so yeah he was an inspiration in that way too mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I i totally i totally agree with you so uh what would you advise traveling entrepreneurs who are busy all the time you know prob probably i'm a great example here probably you are one as well um in terms of lifestyle adjustment what could we do to improve our lives so that we can work more effectively, be smarter, be happier, uh, be less depressed, be more um, mindful and uh, achieve more in less time? Uh, well, yeah, there's, there's lots of things and it, it's still a working, a work in progress for me as well. The, the problem for me is I'll, I'll find a really good balance and then I'll take on something else and then I've got to reshift everything all over again. And, imagine maybe you're quite similar. One thing I've found is that if, I, if I'm interested in working out, uh, then I have to make that 100% my priority. So sometimes I'll have a day 
and don't tell my clients this, I have a day where I've got so much work to do. There's no way I'm going to fit it in. Um, I absolutely can't afford to go to the gym. I go to the gym anyways, because I think if you, you have to be in that mindset, otherwise you're not going to stick with it. And maybe creating like a hierarchy of things that are important to you would be a good place to start to have things that you think that's non-negotiable. I will do this. Um, likewise, one of the things I like about working for myself is the fact that I can socialize with friends uh, during work hours that I can. Um, I pick my wife up from work. It's nice that I can do that because it's quite a horrible commute otherwise. Mm -hmm. And it would be so easy to say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I'm so busy today. I'm so stressed. You know, you know, you get that feeling where it's all just on top of you and you haven't slept properly because you've stayed up late that night to finish the work. And then so you've woken up tired, but then you, you're more behind and you kind of get into this routine. That's why I yeah. think sometimes you put the brake on and say, nah, I'm, I'm going to take today off to be with blah and I'll make it work. Because otherwise, what's the point, you know? So having a kind of hierarchy of what's important to you, I think, is a good, a good thing. Coming up with the right clients, if, you're, if you do provide a service, is really important. Um, and creating a working relationship with them that works for you. Uh, I am lucky enough that I've got one client who just literally takes work when I have it and never pesters me the rest of the time. Stuff like that's fantastic because it means I don't have that fear of not having enough work because I can always fall back on him. Um, I have other clients where... It's a bit more rigid, but you know, you've got to get it to work around the lifestyle you want. So maybe, you know, instead of finding the clients and, or finding the uh, type of work you want to do, think about the lifestyle you want. I mean, this is lifestyle design 101. Think about the lifestyle you want and then take on the clients and the, and the work that fits that um, idea you have in your head. And don't be afraid to keep negotiating, to keep changing it because, you know, you'll, there'll come a time where you need to, you might need to take work that doesn't suit you to start with but the, the risk is that you then get locked into that because it's uh you know stable or whatever you need to be willing to look keep looking outside of that to find things that will better suit your routine and i think it's also a really good idea to um, create i have a minimum target that i earn every single day so if i haven't earned that much money then i don't stop working but i've set that relatively low and then i have like a kind of a kind of ideal target and in order to do that you need to know what it is that you need to earn in order to survive so you make sure you always earn enough to survive because <laughs> that's important and then ideally you earn this much but that's negotiable if something more interesting comes along like an interview with yourself and then you have <laughs> high in the sky aim that you go for if you know if you can but having that kind of this kind of like code red mode like i'll always earn this much that gives me a lot of confidence to then break out and do other things but so yeah it all kind of it all kind of follows on from one another and if you let yourself get out of a good routine then it'll affect your sleep which will affect your productivity which will affect your training which will affect again how much work you do which means you're staying up later so you need to every now and then just do like a reset and think what am i focused on what do i really want to achieve you know and it is important to make sure you're getting the sleep because you'll learn better you'll uh, function better it is important to work out so you maybe put them at the start and then you build around that so yeah a lot of it's just yeah routine and discipline which is hard but it comes with practice i used to um sometimes write 10 to twenty thousand words a day but it's it, which is a lot but it just came with practice it was impossible when i started and by the end i just found ways to make it work mm -hmm. it's interesting so uh you want to keep to this routines as well so what is a problem for me is uh, let's say that I'm having a great routine and then at some at some Friday I would go out and I would just enjoy myself too much and I would come back home at uh, you know nine in the morning the next day and then it takes a lot of time to get yourself back on your sleeping cycle. Um, are you dealing with this somehow? Um, even your knowledge of this hacks or do you just you know don't do it at all? <laughs> yeah well yeah and also like you say of course when you're traveling as well it becomes a lot more difficult to stick to a routine but again partly it is that practiced discipline which really helps i mean i've had it where again i don't recommend this to anyone i've had it where i've come back from a night out at like two in the morning a bit drunk and done work or a workout because you know it just takes that kind of discipline and it does ultimately pay off if you're disciplined now you'll ultimately be better off later on when you wake up and of course there are things you can do like power naps for instance might be useful meditation can be useful for that if you're low on sleep for instance um 
some people said there was a study i can't remember um the details but it found that people who did meditate actually needed slightly less sleep than people who didn't um uh, doing things like setting your uh, clock to wake up at a certain time um energy management and a lot of it as well is i find something that's really useful for me and i've talked about it a bit on my channel is cbt which is cognitive behavioral therapy which is a tool that's used to treat uh, cognitive disorders like phobias, anxieties, that kind of thing. But I think it can be kind of like flipped on its head to benefit um, you, like, like I say, to be better than well. It basically means looking at your thought processes and how they're affecting your behavior and just being more aware of them. And when it comes to being really tired and, and um, sleepy, obviously there are you know, physical, physiological um, issues if you don't get enough sleep, but a lot of it actually is stress and if you can control your breathing as in you're having a stress response to having not enough sleep that's why you feel bad other than the you know buildup of adenosine and various other factors that's the main reason you feel bad so if you can control your breathing um, there's a technique i like called box breathing where you breathe in for four seconds and out for four seconds and hold for four seconds and various other ones if you can do that and if you can remind yourself that actually i can function well i have done in the past because sometimes you have days where you have a couple of hours sleep and you're just fine, don't you? And then other days you have a couple of hours sleep and you feel like ass. So a lot of it's psychological. And yeah, being aware, that makes a big difference, I find. Yeah, when you're really tired, I think it's so tempting to just uh, crash out and not do anything. But if you're disciplined, still within those working hours, then it'll ultimately pay off. The worst thing to do, though, is to do that kind of half-working thing that I'm sure you're familiar with, where you're actually barely working at that point it's better to go to sleep even if it's just for an hour and come back a few minutes and come back and do it a bit fresher mm -hmm. i understand yeah that makes that that makes perfect sense so i i think i do resonate with this one thing i didn't understand exactly you said you would come back from the party and then you would still work out at home or is this what you said yeah, this, or? Was when I was, this was when i was younger i say i don't recommend that one but it's just like that kind of discipline to do it when you're really tired. So what you should actually do is go to bed, wake up the time you'd normally wake up, and then still go to the gym. You might feel awful, but you'll feel better quicker than if you lie in and then let the whole you know, vicious cycle carry on because then you'll sleep in and you'll feel worse and you'll not do your work. So it's better to still go to bed, still get up, and then, and then do it that way. And I say, you need to use a couple of things to help you out, like perhaps a nootropic. I don't actually recommend modafinil, but I know a lot of people would use that to combat things like lack of sleep. Um, like I say, uh, breathing techniques, bit of meditation, these things can help you through. And, you know, maybe, like I say, that's when you then set yourself the target of the lower what you want to achieve that day. But still, don't, don't let yourself get out of any kind of routine because you'll ultimately regret it. I mean, even when you travel, it's best, isn't it, to, to work at certain times if you can, rather than just, I mean, of course, in where you can as well to make life easier for yourself. You need that, that separation between on time and off time. And if you, if you aren't productive in your on time, then you'll end up eating into your off time. Mm -hmm. So what you're, what you're suggesting is just to cut off this vicious circle. So for example, you're coming back home at, you know, let's say seven in the morning and you wake up every day at nine. So you would just sleep for two hours and just carry on during the I day would, and just go to sleep the same time the, the day or. I would recommend that over the alternative being to sleep in for, you know, get your full eight hours and then get completely behind. If you're right. like us and you for yourself, just because you'll take weeks to catch up. Whereas if you do that, do the minimum amount of work, try and be as disciplined as possible, as focused as possible, say meditate, say so take, a, take a cold shower, whatever helps you to get a bit more energy. And then you can still then relax at, you know, 6 p.m., 7 p.m., whatever time you finish. And then, because I, I, I kind of think that in all sorts of senses, you have a kind of, um, an on state and an off state. So you have catabolism and anabolism in bodybuilding. So you're catabolic when you're burning energy um, and you're anabolic when you're building muscle and you have the fight or flight response and you have rest and digest. And this is the same thing. Um, and fo you're focused when you're in the catabolic state, when you're in the fight or flight. And as you know, stress isn't necessarily a bad thing. You have a stress, which means you're um, stressed enough to be motivated. And then um, after that, you need to rest though, because after a while, being con continuously in that kind of fight or flight state, um, it takes its toll on your body because energy is directed to your uh, brain and it's directed to your muscles, but it's not being directed to your immune system 
it's not being directed towards your digestion, which can, which can cause malnutrition. So if you stay in this state where you're constantly waking up stressed late um, and you're constantly rushing because you're not finished, then you're constantly catabolic. You're constantly in fight or flight. Eventually you'll reach adrenal fatigue, which means you won't be producing as many of the um, uh, hormones and neurons that you need to keep going and everything will start to deteriorate. And this is even when you start to see injuries occur in the gym. We make it much worse for ourselves because of things like phones. I'm sure you've heard that uh, laptops create blue light and all this. So you, in order to be at your best when you're most focused, you also need to make sure you're taking that downtime. You need to create that separation where you're properly relaxed mentally and physically. That's when you grow muscle. It's when you uh, build the new neural connections. Sleep is the most anabolic state there is because that's when you're completely relaxed and your body's just restoring itself. You're more creative when you're um, relax when you're anabolic. You actually um, explore the neural pathways more. Whereas when you're focused, you're better at outputting work that you've already thought of. When you're relaxed, you're better at coming up with new ideas, which is why taking a walk is a brilliant way to come up with ideas. So uh, that's why I think it's so important to maintain that separation between on and off. And if you get out of any kind of routine where you're now, you know, like say partying late or whatever, you have to resist the urge to let let your whole next day be a write-off where you're still stressed because you're behind. You need to, even if it means saying to a client, I'm, I, I always try not to do this because I think one of the most important things in our line of work is to be reliable. But if, if it means that you're going to be working till, you know, all kinds of crazy hours, I think it's better to just yeah, create that separation, go back to normal. It takes discipline, but knowing that you've got that relaxation later on also makes it easier to be productive during your on time. Have you read the book Deep Work by any chance? Uh, I haven't read the entire book, but I understand the concept. Yeah, yeah. It, you, to be honest, it's a really good book, but you don't need to. Like once you read the blurb on the back, you kind of get the gist. But yeah, he's the same thing, and that's a good. It shows you, you know, how valuable working deeply can be. And he also talks about walking and being creative. And this is something else I like to do when I'm when I'm in my downtime. I don't mind thinking about work if it's something that I enjoy, like ways to promote the Bioneer, because like I say, that's when you're more creative. And if you do that. And you've got the ideas ready for them when you're focused, when you're in your focus time, and you can just bang out however many words or programs or whatever else it is you need to do, emails. Yeah. Do you think it's possible for high achievers like you or me to still drink alcohol or eat sugar or um, whatever unhealthy eats meats? Do you think it's okay? Or you would say, okay, Cigarettes, no. Alcohol, okay, but this is the limit. And meat, okay, but this is the limit. What is your current take on that? But I'm talking about a balance. Obviously, it's probably healthier not to drink alcohol at all. It's probably better not to eat sugar at all. It's probably healthier not to meat, eat meat at all. But you know, just taking into consideration this balance that we are all seeking in life, and um, you know. I, 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 guess, I guess if I would not drink alcohol at all, for example, which I did um, for a certain period of my life, I just, um, I just wouldn't enjoy it. So I guess there is certain balance, but I was wondering, what is your take on that? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, because obviously you can get to the point where you're counting every single calorie and you're going to bed at nine o'clock every night and you're not drinking any alcohol or smoking or doing anything. And yeah, I mean, ultimately, that might make you perform better, but it also means that I mean, being that disciplined, that takes energy as well, and it's tiring. I personally, I actually, in the last three months, I haven't been drinking, but I normally do drink. I enjoy like going out with friends and things, and I'm aware that it has a negative impact on my performance and things. But I guess, yeah, it has to, you have to listen to your own body, you know, how negative is that? impacts. I know some people who have terrible hangovers and some people who don't have any at all. Um, and also how much do you enjoy it? Is it, is it a worthy sacrifice? I'm not someone who will come home and drink. You know, a lot of people I know who, um, like you say, who aren't high achiever types, not so career driven, let's say they'll come home after a day at work and they'll just drink a beer on the couch. To me, I don't see as that as being terribly uh, beneficial or productive. I mean, that's just going to slightly um, impair your recovery and things rather than, and you will potentially feel that a little bit the next day, but not enough to, that you've actually had a good time. If you see what I mean, um, I'd rather do it, you know, in a social setting, for instance. Um, I've always been someone who's been quite 
lucky with my metabolism. I and probably eat more sugary things than I should do. You know, I, I enjoy desserts with my wife because she's got quite a sweet tooth. That, you know, when your wife's, that's one of the hardest things about all these things is, is the social aspect. Because when you're out with friends, they're drinking. When you're out with your wife, she wants to have a nice uh, chocolate dessert to share. That often makes the most difficult. And you don't want to just have no fun or there's no point. And I'm not, I'm not all about working towards some goal where I'm rich. I want to be happy now as well. So yeah, it's about listening to your body. And as I've got older, I realized that I can get away with um, Mars bars and things less. So I've cut it down. And I guess it's that. It's, it's if you are tired than you need to be to do the things you want to do. And if you're feeling groggy, then maybe look at your lifestyle and think, what do I need to cut out? But if you're performing well and you fancy a treat, I wouldn't beat yourself up about it because, you know, I think unwinding once in a while is good for you. And, and for me personally, I don't think it's been too much of a negative impact. In fact, I think sometimes it's, it's a positive thing because it gives you that outlet, something to look forward to, etc. But yeah, everyone's different. And I guess it's just assessing your own performance and maybe even keeping a diary. You know, try not drinking. That's what I'm doing at the moment. Try not uh, eating sugary snacks and then see if you perform better. Mm-hmm. And then you can just see for yourself, basically, like, hey, I just yeah. feel better or I feel worse. Yeah, and I mean, the fun of working out is that it means that you can get away with eating a bit worse stuff, although that's probably not the best way to look at it. But, you know, I always think it's important when it comes to working out, I think it's more important to get good nutrition than it is to not get bad nutrition, if you see what I mean. More, more important to consume all your nutrients and to have enough protein than it is to never eat a sausage roll. I mean, don't live off sausage rolls, but I don't think one is going to really undo all your good work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, that's that's a great advice. That's a really, really, really valuable. The last thing I have as a question um, to to everyone I'm interviewing is, uh, what kind of man- mindset you're going with for the last um, you know years that took you from where you are right now? Sorry, from where where, where you were to where you are right now. What kind of mindset uh, it is? And some of the guys are sharing very interesting insights, such as. Um, for example, they started being more abundant with their knowledge and sharing things. So, for example, as you're doing, some of the guys uh, have other advice. Can you share, as a last question for today, because I'm exploiting you a lot already, um, what was the mindset that you were using over all this time, achieving what you have achieved and you know, being where you are right now? It's a little bit of a deeper question, but... <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I've, I've enjoyed all these questions. Uh, well, I would say that my mindset's evolved over time when I started out, but it's always had, um, I think, all each success is, is to do with mindset, like you say, and I've, I've always, I guess, thought a little bit differently than some of my friends who were, you know, took you know, the more tra- uh, traditional path of going into employment. Uh, when I started out, uh, partly, I guess, it came from a fact, the fact that I... I'm not someone who particularly likes uh, taking orders or following instruction. That, that alone gave me the motivation to, to do what I wanted to do. I think going to the gym once again actually helped a lot because when you go to the gym, you learn the importance of just doing stuff. I get really frustrated when someone comes up to me and they say, oh, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to get in the best shape of my life. Can you write me a training program? And I'm like, yeah, here it is. And, and then they'll say, oh, I want to do more. I'm going I'm to go to the gym six times a week for an hour and I'm not going to eat anything sugary. Um, Day. And then, of course, they fail within two weeks because it's just too ambitious. They're already tired. They're already if they're overweight for a reason, probably because they don't have enough time in the day. What makes them think they now have the energy and the time to train for five hours? Um, and so it really annoys me when people like have these pie in the sky ideas. Whereas when you work out consistently, you realise that to get consistent results, you need to be consistent. So, and that sometimes means just doing the the, the work that's got to be done. Even occasionally, it's not fun. So that might mean in my case, working my way up from the bottom with writing, just saying, I will do this, putting myself out there, doing the writing. A lot of people, again, they want to start a business. They want to start from the top. They're like, oh, I'm going to go after these huge clients. Um, I want to work for this big paper. And I'm like, well, you've got no experience. And, and it's not just a matter of building that portfolio. It's also a matter of building the confidence of learning what people want, the nuance. And you learn, you learn so many small things that you can't really be taught just through experience and getting your feet dirty. Um, so 
So that was the, the, the main driving factor that made me originally able to support myself, um, and, you know, live on my own without having to have a proper job was just, you know, saying I will do it. And with my app, actually so many people come up with an app idea and they say, it's going to be this game changing social network that will connect, um, entrepreneurs. And I'm like, mm -hmm. have you made an app before? And they'll say no. And I'm like, why can't you start with something simple like a calculator? Why have you got to start with a game changing app? So you know, the apps that I made were easy things that I knew I could make quickly. And another problem is a lot of people don't release their apps because they, they become self-conscious of them because they're perfectionist. Whereas I like the fail fast approach um, where you release lots of things, you see what works. And if it works, you focus on that because the great thing about the web is that nothing's permanent. You can improve and upgrade it over time. So again, you know, don't, don't be scared. Don't, don't, delay, don't make excuses. And that's again where CBT comes in, assess yourself. Why am I not doing this? Is it because I'm, I don't want the criticism? Is it because, you know, I like to, to uh, reference Tim Ferriss again. I like his fear setting um, approach. I thought that was really good. Um, and then over more recently, like I say, I've kind of evolved to the point where um, I see myself more as a brand. And I think that's very important. And I've started to you know, a lot of people say about finding your life's purpose and all this. You hear that on a lot of, uh, on a lot of self-help um, literature, which I've always thought was a bit naff. But as you, as you go through your kind of own personal journey and you, you gain certain experience, you find that certain things gravitate towards you and you gravitate towards certain things. You gain certain experiences. People start to turn to you for certain types of advice. And gradually, you do sort of start to know a bit more who you are and what it is you want. And I think that's, that's really helped me lately to grow my channel and to get better paid work, et cetera. So, but don't expect that to come right away. That's awesome. Thank you so much for all this valuable knowledge. I'm sure my audience will appreciate that a lot. So um, if you guys uh, want to check Adam out, you can definitely do so. So I'm going to put a link to his channel. And yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate all the value, Adam. Uh, thank you very much. It's been really interesting. Great questions and thanks for the opportunity to get to uh, meet some of your followers. Awesome. All right, I'll stop recording. Breathe and feel the life and feel our heart.